Welcome everyone to another episode of Schmooze with Coos. I'm with Bo Miles in the studio. Well, we're in a junk office studio today. We are, mate. Yeah, this is um, this is the one that the film was made out of, and where you're on a ready-made box slash mic stand, and I've got a mic stand. I feel quite official. You look, you've got the junk the junk set up, mate. If you if you're not watching this on YouTube, I have a um, I guess a, a grocery box that's uh, been uh, makeshifted into a into a mic stand. Bloody um, good job, man. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't waste stuff. Nice and simple, yeah. Yeah, Bo Miles, if you don't know who Bo Miles is, he's a uh, he's a lecturer here at Monash University, um, an adventurer, filmmaker, um, book writer at the moment. Yeah, or trying just, to trying to be. Have yeah. you finished that book yet? No. I've finished a bunch of chapters, but they're finished is a pretty loose term, Josh. <laughs> I've got January fifteen deadline and that's gotta be a pretty good manuscript. Yeah. And at right. this stage I reckon it's it's gonna be a a manuscript. <laughs> I don't know whether there's going to be any adjective with it. And you've got a title for it, yeah? Oh, there's a bunch floating around, but they're pretty tied on titles, the publisher. The pub- publisher. So uh, the, the idea is that it's about um, good food, good doing stuff, um, quirky adventures, quirky ideas, and just stories of, I suppose, 40 years of being um, being Bo, 20 of which are adult, 20 of which are uh, so I sort of do it in that sort of split. I set it up as right. I both had this eclectic childhood, or what I think is eclectic, yeah. and that's led to this sort of eclectic adulthood, which may or may not be eclectic depending on which way you read it. But um, I hope to think it's pretty interesting. But it's not finished. So is that a bow biography? <laughs> no, no. It's a story just about. Look, the sub chapters at the moment, or the chapters, or the themes are um, eating, doing, making. And that's it. And then underneath each one of those, I'll, I'll pull out the best sort of anecdotes of my life that suit those themes. Yeah, right. So it plays really well into sort of a good, just a good, well-balanced life, which I don't think people live these days. They uh-huh. live highly specialised lives mm. and they're hopeless at doing breadth and mm. they're fantastic at doing something that's got depth, you know. Um, and I don't think depth is any good when you don't have breadth. That's my whole shtick, which is a problem with academia. But we'll get to that. As we become a, a more screen-heavy um, society, do you think we're having not enough adventures? I'm really, um, I'm really careful about saying what we do well and what we don't do well in the modern era because yeah. I just don't know. I've been an adult for 20 years mm. and there's been adulthood for billions of years <laughs> and we all compare ourselves to, in a sense, things we don't know about. We have this abstract idea of them and we imagine them. Mm. Um, let's say that we don't have more adventures these days. That's shutting down all of the potentials of things that I don't consider adventure. You know, something like a screen adventure, you know, um, virtual reality, I've never done it. I've never put on the big goggles and gone into that world. But I imagine it's pretty pretty full on. Mm. I imagine you can be scared. I imagine you can kill people. I imagine you could fall in love with people in there. You know, I, I think that's full on, right? Mm. And so that sense of perception, which I haven't tapped into, which might very well be adventure, might be a whole other world that's in front of us based on digital technology and screens and things that I have no comprehension of. So I'm very reluctant to say we're less adventurous. Um, mm. But from the outset, I would think, yes, when I see people wandering around on their screens, you could say, yes, we are probably are. But are we, are we not adventuring outside enough? Yeah, well, that's another definition of, you know, that's another fluxy sort of place, yeah. you know, um, why is outside better than inside? You know, mm-hmm. it's taken all, all of human existence to get four walls up with with styrofoam walls and electricity and running water. Um, what is the outside giving us that the inside doesn't, in a sense, you know, maybe we're getting safety and security and warmth and all of that stuff in here. That's pretty good. That's good stuff, you know. Oddly enough, we replicate that when we go out into a tent. Um, we zip up in a mini house, and mm. um, but we're just in this. We can hear more, and we can see more, and whatever. Seeking shelter. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and you know, and I find it funny too when I try and always talk myself down of all of these things. I think natively we are not doing well, and mm. I don't think we go outside anywhere near enough. Absolutely. Uh, but then I know that we probably need to live in cities too. We can't have ten billion people with five acres each anymore because there's too many of us so we need to be more urban it's probably better for the world that way and so 
shit, I've got to redefine my terms. Hmm. Let's let's draw back to you, Bo. If you could describe yourself in five words. That's a really hard one too. There's um when uh when Macbeth is it Hamish Macbeth? No, that's a character. When um Shakespeare died, apparently when you cobble together all of the words he used in all of his work, it was about ten thousand words. A university graduate now, and I read this years ago, it's probably I don't know, Bubkus, but uh it used to be that a university graduate would have between three and 4,000 words in their vernacular when they graduated with a bachelor's degree. So I find it staggering that, you know, 500 years later after Shakespeare kicked around, we're using half the amount of words to describe our world, which we probably know more about. Or maybe we don't, that's just it. So for me to give you five words, <laughs> and let's say I'm in between an, an undergrad and Shakespeare, let's say I've got 8,000 words in my vocab, um, to give you five that describe me. I could give you five today, but I dare say, and I hope to think that my five words would be different tomorrow. We talked about this briefly before we started recording. I, I think I'm ambitious, but I'm, I'm trying to get to terms or come to terms with that idea of ambition, ambitious. I'm critical of myself and others. I'm, I'm trying to look for I keep using the word adventure. I'm still trying to get to grips with what adventure is, you know, mm. adventurous. Uh, gee, it's a bloody, it's a hard question. Um, fun. I want to have more fun. I used to be a lot of fun and I'm not a lot as, not as much fun these days, I don't think. And the fifth, I don't know. I'll come back to you by the end of the show. I'll give you a fifth word. Right. Something will come we'll to me. Finish on a fifth. Good on you. Now, what led you into the outdoor ed field? Outdoor ed? So I, um, I was a country kid, right? So I think being a country kid trumps outdoor ed any day of the week. Yeah. If you live, if you live on small acreage or a farm, and you know how to, you know, jump on the back of a tractor and chop wood and know what that gum tree is, and you know, watch it through the seasons. Like you see seasons as a country kid, you definitely do. You're dirtier. You're outside more. You use your hands more. You copy your parents more because they're doing outside stuff. It's outdoor ed on a, on toast. And so I was already that kid. And so my dad thought Outdoor Ed was a load of shit. It was basically just me having to go away and do things that we'd do at home anyway, which was half true. But my mum persisted and sent me on a couple of camps. Um, and when I was 14, I found this place or sent to this place called Wollongara uh, out near um, Mafra in the foothills of the Alpine National Park. And that was it. I went on this program and I had my first heroes or at least the people I regard as my first heroes, other than my parents. Um, Jimmy James and these young 20-year-old staff who wore flannelette shirts and had big smiles and, you know, wore, wore big hats. And they were so capable, the girls and guys. And I thought, they are just cool. And so I went on a hike and then was asked back on their, their sort of alpine walk that they do at the end of the year with, with sort of kids that they think are appropriate and... Away I went and I did a, a 10 day hike when I was 14, and that was it. I was sold. Awesome. That's my outdoor ed sort of start point where I thought, yeah. shit, you know, I could do this. And yeah. even last week, we did a 10 day paddle down the Murray or an eight day paddle on a 10 day program. And it was, um, you have moments out there, you think, geez, Bo, you're getting paid for this. This is ridiculous with all these 20 year olds that are your friends. You know, you're mentoring these young people and you're still kind of young yourself and you're doing this and it's a job. It's, it's, brilliant yeah and you see the best and worst of australia out there and you get to share it with them if you haven't seen any of bo's work uh on his youtube channel uh, it's just simply bo miles um you you build a lot of stuff and you, you you're awesome with cutting up wood and just turning it into all sorts of stuff yeah um where did that carpentry background come well, from? would have started with dad yeah. i mean mum was the gardener and super handy mum's really handy she's a really good sewer and then dad, he's, he's, he's an artist and re really good with his hands too. And he built all of the buildings at his house, all the sheds in his studio and renovated the house and gallery and can do all that stuff. So I learned with dad first, doing, doing cubby houses and carts and just fixing stuff. I used to nail a lot, you know, poor old dad would come out and I've used 50 nails in one little piece of timber, you know, just banging stuff. I used to love it. And then all through school, I... Um, I did, you know, those year 10 work ready program sort of things you used to do. Yeah, right. Off I went and did a building thing for a couple of weeks and thought, shit, this is all right, you know. And um, and then my sister started dating a builder. And so I, I went off and worked for him for years. Yeah, And right. he really 
taught me how to build. You know, he's bloody, he's a good builder and had a work ethic to boot, you know, so just hang on and keep up. And so I, I got a lot of work ethic from him and learned how to, he was fussy, and learned how to build, yeah. And was that, um, were you doing outdoor ed stuff while that was happening or did that yeah, seep kinda. into um, life later on? Yeah, I did outdoor ed at school and then I did, I took a year off, I took a gap year and did an outdoor ed traineeship. And that was just really field heavy. So, yeah, in between that, so that was, I don't know, it was 180 or 186 days or something in the field that year. Uh, and then in between that, I'd worked at a camping store. And, yeah, during the summers, I would go off and do stints with Brad, this builder, and, mm. and do, you know, two and three and four week housing projects. Um, and did that for years. Yeah. So it was all kind of meshed into one, you know. Now, outdoor ed, I, it often gets even... When I was applying for a course uh, here at Monash University, um, if the listeners don't know, I did a, I've done two years of a health and PE course at Monash Uni and it's been fantastic. And if you want to become a health and physical educator, um, physical education educator, um, Good work. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's the course for you. Initially, there's a lot of talk, you know, doing an outdoor ed spech or specialism um people talk about it as a i guess a dying field is that something that you've seen is it just talk or i think the trends in what is important for a student's educational life particularly between the ages of 10 and 18 i think um it it really is trends based in some respects and so it should be it kind of goes up and down with where the quality lies Mm. Uh, that's not my research area. I don't know a lot about it, about where that quality does lie at all times. It's it's not my thing, and which is probably not a good thing. But I, I do know that um, I think HPE, if you just to look at the words health, physical education, mm. and outdoor education, you've got some pretty broad definitions within what define those fields. Uh, I would think in today's kind of climate change crisis and our outdoor, you know, nature deficit mm. i think this is they, they are right up the street of being very important in people's lives i buried an alpaca a couple of days ago my mum's got a couple of alpacas and one died unexpectedly and it was dusk and an alpaca is about the size of a, a large man and digging that hole i was very thoughtful about life and death and you don't often have those experiences where you you know you you're so front line with life and death mm. you know to pull apart its legs and things to fit it in a hole um, it was quite, uh, it's fantastic. And kids, kids totally dig that stuff. That hands-on experience really shapes you. I will, I spend more time inside now than outside. Mm. And I've had that transition. You know, I, I can't be outside more as an academic working in a uni as much as we try to, to be outside as much as we can. My currency is writing or teaching mm. or non-field work in many respects, you know. So if you're to break apart my year, it's way more inside. And yet the irony is it's outdoor education and the better I get and my field gets, uh, the more inside we go. Yeah. Um, same with building, you know. I know all great builders, they end up being really good mentors mm. or mentors a lot more and less on the tools. So it makes sense, you know. We, we all know this. So it's not really about good and bad. It's about your you know, what you do when you're outside and how, and how that influences your insidedness, which is the great X factor of outdoor ed. What do you do out there that makes you better when you're back? And uh, I think that's the flaw of outdoor ed too. I don't think we do a very good job of it often. I think there's too much out there and not enough back here. Um, let's move on to some of the adventures you've had. Um, you did a, um, a short little film called A Mile an Hour mm-hmm. and... You ate licorice. Yeah, I'm a licorice hour. fiend. Yeah, I love it. Now it's I it's, forgot a few have, hours too, and I couldn't believe it. The very thing that makes me bloody go around in circles, and I forgot a few hours. Does that have some kind of energy potency that's good for running, or it's you just nah, like that's licorice? just a gimmick? And, and I love licorice. I bloody love it. You know, if I if I'm ever on a because a lot of people island. don't like licorice. I know it divides people, it's, and I can't understand how it divides people so much. Like but black uh, jelly beans. Yeah, and tofu. No, nah, nah. maybe uh, brock- uh, Brussels sprouts. Yeah, that's a I, big divider. And I love them. I love Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. What do you think sprouts. of licorice? I like a licorice. I, I like long black coffee as well. So maybe there's a, a theme there. It's just 
Anything well, that's bitter or it's got an unusual taste. And Vegemite is another one. That you like? I'll have it on bread. Yeah. I probably wouldn't have it in a sandwich with cheese, though. Okay. Because a sandwich with cheese is kind of breadish. I think because of the, <laughs> the soft... Cheese. I think the soft bread... Okay. ...makes it different. Yeah, cool. This, this, oh, you're talking about toast. Yeah, well, toast, when it's, when it's toasted, it's crunchy. Yeah. And you get that, that nice little film of, of Vegemite on yeah. there. But if you've got it in a sandwich, it, it becomes this creamy array of bitter, soft Ah, you stay bread. away from that. Yeah. Yeah, I'd... I'd I just don't really like so it. So it's a texture thing, I think, a lot yeah. of people. I know a lot of vegetarians are texture people, as in they, uh, they don't like meat because of texture. Okay. Good night of mine here at Monash, Jody. And that's how it starts. And I just don't tend to be fussy with texture. Mm. So I tend to eat. I don't have any sort of faux pas with food as such. There's some things I eat more than others, but I don't really. So you don't have a certain diet that you stick by? A... I eat a lot of vegetables. Mm. I I. I piss twice a night because i eat so many vegetables <laughs> which are just loaded you know so and, and oddly enough i don't drink enough water or very i don't drink very much water because i eat so many vegetables so you're getting a lot of that h2o from your veggies yeah which are basically pure water you yeah. know with a color pigment and a few other minerals in there you know <laughs> if you learn anything from this podcast today folks go and have a bowl of veggies yeah too right mate that's that's gold you, you can know? roast them you can steam them you can eat them raw yeah yeah, some and and that's funny too. And the more you get into how much you cook them and how you cook them, yeah, some they're all on a spectrum of how much bang for your buck you're getting on how you cook them and how much you mm. cook them like, in terms of nutrients. Yeah, you're talking, yeah, yeah. So carrots, for example, so they say, mm. are much better cooked. Okay. Whereas some other vegetables are bloody near, you know, uh, kill you if you eat them too much raw. Yeah. Like beans, for example, with yes. uh, lanocaine, not lanocaine. Um, Forget the cane in there. It's got some sort of protein that really kicks your ass <laughs> if yeah, you eat right. them raw. Green vegetables, I think, are good. Not you know, just a little bit of steam in the veggies, but not not overcooking them because then they lose all their vitamins. Exactly, they just go. They, they just become this they limp wilt. water-based thing. Yeah, yeah. that's why. A, look, a, a frozen packet of veggies probably isn't quite. It's not quite there, you know. They've gone through a lot. Oh, I find it amazing how they put a nutritional value on frozen veggies. And I'm not ganging up on frozen veggies because no. I'd, I'd eat them over non-frozen veggies yeah, for course. sure. But you know, they've got this 417 calories per 100 grams of this particular vegetable, mm. and you think, gee, I wonder. If that's a value that they've given to 100 grams of a fresh one, and I'm wondering if there is actual correlation there. I don't know. Um, I, I spoke to uh, a guy named Stu Cox last season and he did the Marathon de Saab in yep. the Saharan Desert in Africa. Uh, and he um, he spoke about having a team around him because uh, I went went into the podcast and uh, and at one point I said, you know, uh, as, a, as an individual and I, as an individual, what's it what's it like out there? you know it's it, is it all? Is it just a mental battle? How do you um, how do you perform? How do you get yourself ready for that? Uh, and he and he really um, picked me up on the point about having a team around you, and that you know running and you know these adventure sports are not just about the individual; it's about the the team around you. How how does your team help you? Who who's in your team? Well, I mean, I've got my family, so mm. it's all born out of mum and dad being particular kind of people, I suppose, back in the in the day. And then as adults emerged, uh, you get these key allies. I've always had great partners. You know, the women in my life have been brilliant and always just go and do what you've got to do, Bo, you know. Mm. Um, so Helen now, currently my wife, um, who's the love of my life. She's an amazing woman. So she's, she's, she's numero uno. If she doesn't endorse something, I just won't do it. Mm. And she hasn't not endorsed things. You know, she's really good as a litmus test. Um, and then, of course, my little film crew around me who, who really aren't my film crew. We're just a team. And so there's Mitch, who's my key collaborator. He's on the end of a, f a camera now. And he's a better shot maker than me these days. He's bloody great, you know. I'm less fussy about shots and more about the intensity in the story. So was he out on the bass with you? No, no. He, but he did, he did see us off. Yep. So he did a lot of the preview stuff. And he did fly out to the key island, to Flinders Island. Yep. And then he came into Tassie. So... Yeah. Um, yeah, he was at sort of three key junctions and then all the in-between stuff yeah, I right. film myself. And I've, and I've been filming myself for years and sometimes I'm lazy and sometimes I'm inspired and don't do it right. And 
I'm sometimes a bit hit and miss with my self-filming, but getting better. And in many respects, I'm getting better at self-filming because Mitch is making these beautiful succulent shots off to the side yeah. and I've got to match it, you know, because otherwise it just looks a bit too clunky. Um, and then other people like Chris Ord and and, uh, and Brett Campbell, these guys that come in and they're sort of pinch hit, uh, Dave Cutperson with music and sound engineering and mm. James Dobson. So there's really cool dudes that I, that are, that I trust and that will get things done and they're super important. Otherwise, it's just some red-headed bloke out there trying to make it an ego tape, you know. It's got to be a shared experience and in many respects, I'm just the voice piece for a shared story, you know. When you're out there, are you pretty, you know, struck by the 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 landscape, the the vastness of mm. our planet? I am hugely and immensely, and and in in fact, that's why I've come back to sort of more home adventures now because, you know, the universe the universe looks the same when you look through a telescope or when you look through a microscope. I often use that metaphor. At macro level and micro level, they're both just an incredible amount of moving parts. Mm. And so when you, I, I can now do adventures within five kilometers of my home and I, they're hard and they're perceptive and they're challenging and they're, um, they're fun and they're technical and all the things that I would, I would put across to something like paddling around the bottom of Africa. And and yet I'm home within 20 minutes, and so it's um, it just changes things. Now I know too that often adventure is seen that you can't have it within 20 minutes at home, and I get that you don't have that sense of exotic and distance and scale, but you've only got to challenge that within your own sense of perception and and your rules that you set for yourself, and the sky's the limit. And that's why it comes back to that question 20 minutes ago: What is adventure? Well, shit, you can really shape that yourself, and that's what this book's going to do. That's a good, great spin around. It's a nice synergy. Well, yeah, and the book is all about me trying to touch, and it's it's a non PhD uh, form of Bo writing about how he thinks the world works, you yeah, know? Um, and trying to take myself out of it. And not not everything I've done in the past is inherently good, and, and I and I say that as in oh, I'm just this white bloke with with that's able to jump on a plane and go and have these adventures well shit that's not that's not the norm and nor is it a good thing all the time so question it yeah. mm. the filmmaking when did that start becoming a i guess is it an obsession well it was i i i thought oh out to red's going to be my side gig and i'm going to be a filmmaker and that was pretty early on that was sort of 1920 after i did that traineeship and i took a camera to nepal i borrowed it off a family friend and took a camera and and once again, I was looking for the hero's journey and I was I was a hopeless shot maker. I just didn't get the camera out anywhere near enough for all the interesting things that I really like now for my cold hands or a foot in a muddy muddy uh, puddle. Were you teaching yourself the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I just didn't have, I didn't have a mentor, a filmmaking mentor mm. at all. And now, and even now, I, I still, now I just get inspired by watching other people's work and try and create, recreate things, you know. So anyway, the film thing's been around a long time and I've stitched that into now um, Out to Red and my life here at Monash, which, you know, visual ethnography and making films and trying to get some sort of traction that this is this can be my currency in a university space. But that's hard too, you know. I'm not, a, I'm not in creative arts. I'm, I'm in the wrong faculty in some degree. But I would argue that I'm bloody not. I mean, I'm in a really... The education faculty is a really powerful, great faculty... Mm let's use some visual stuff uh why can't i go and make a film for an hour and it takes me six months to produce and it's thoughtful and it's great and it can get a wider audience than a five thousand word peer review article that i don't particularly want to do for the rest of my life and i think has a closed in audience i think it's i think it's a shit use of knowledge and energy Mm. that's more the point I think it's a shit use of energy yeah and I think something I found when I was doing the course as well is it's it's a lot of essays it's a lot of writing out your thoughts and you know uh, we encourage ironically as training teachers us to differentiate our learning and to um, provide opportunities for students to express their knowledge in different ways in the university course I don't really think 
that that is emphasized enough in practice mm. because we are a lot of the time writing essays or we're writing lesson plans and then we're getting a really small window to do some teaching um and say for my interest i i've really gotten into media of recent times this year um is there opportunity for students to um you know make films or um create media to express this knowledge well you're up against it because i I agree and and it's 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 in a sense you know the the red bloodedness in me would say how dare they say that we can't use the subjectivity of a visual medium to mark a student and yet i completely and utterly understand why they can say no bo let's just continue with what we know and you've got 500 years worth of university gumption and knowledge and and structures and assessment procedures out there that have created these things like degrees and whatnot and the the currency of that is text it's black and white text on a page Mm. um now as we and funnily enough too an email went out last week uh from our courses leader who said you know we're plagiarizing more more than we've ever seen I did receive that. There you go. So you received the email. It's very hard to plagiarize something like a film in Mm. in a sense. Um, Or in my mind, it's far harder (laughs) because, uh, you know, unless you pay someone to get behind a camera and go and do it, and I suppose you could, then... You can't really copy and paste a film. You you could snip little bits together. Yeah. But even then, if you're snipping bits together, it's still something completely different as soon as you... That's right. I, I would that. just, I mean, that's just one example of, okay, so yeah. maybe we're coming to the point where, you know, this text-based form of knowledge passing over is is a wonderful form, but it's not the only form. I don't think it's a good and bad thing. It's, no. a, it's a, let's let's bring in others. And mm. this is in an era where Australia is trying to embrace our Indigenous culture. And it's it's totally counterproductive or it's it's counterfeit or it's just, lying to ourselves when we think okay here's this wonderful culture who we who we now respect or we should respect more and we should bring into our culture more and yet their knowledge passing was largely non-textual mm-hmm. it was songs and it was artwork and it was animals and it was bloody walks you know dances all these wonderful things and they've been around for 50 or 60 or 80 thousand years passing on all this beautiful knowledge better for the earth and yet all we've got is a black and white page. You know, I think, shit, you know, let's... Why why can't YouTube or, or Vimeo or bloody Instagram be a really vibrant, full-blown form of knowledge, especially when all of us have a phone in our pocket? Yeah, we're trying to um, trying to grab these stories and, and I guess make it easier for a Western society to, to absorb it. Um, it's we we want we want to embrace this culture this this forty thousand year history of life in Australia, but we want to do it a certain way. Yeah, we want to do it a way way. Yeah, yeah. Let's massage it into a thing, and it's Put taken it me textbook. my whole adult life to figure out just how uh, persecuted that form of knowledge is, and mm. you know, and, and I suppose, and I don't, I've never liked saying I'm part of it. Because I'm just this little country red-headed kid that grew up knowing no other. Um, so now as an adult, I, I do know better and I've got to try and fix that. Mm. And, and, and There's a genuine deep hurt out there and, and I'm starting to get it. Mm. I really am, yeah. Let's move on from that topic. Mm. Um, what's been your most challenging expedition so far? Out of all your films, <laughs> out of all the, the places you've gone, uh, what was the most challenging so there's challenge, you know, this whole scale of challenge thing and whether it's hard and I don't believe there's a physical challenge and a mindful challenge. I think it's all just one stitched into the same thing. Um, look, there are moments in Africa where I start my PhD, the very opening pages really are, are about this particular day at sea where I you know, I suppose you look death in the face. You know, I had a pretty scary moment out there with a big wave, an unexpected wave. Uh, and so that was pretty full on you know it was a boat killing trip and probably a bow killing trip and certainly the end of lots of things i'm fundamentally scared of death so that 
even now sitting here talking to you, I don't want to die. I Is have, that why you do so much stuff? Yeah. Yep. In mm. a very raw, simplistic way, yeah. I just don't want to die. And so I want to experience as much as I can because... Mm. I know this thing is coming up and it scares the shit out of me, Gen- it genuinely. Mm. Kept me up as a kid. You know, I sort of tapped into it when I was 13 or 14 and I thought, shit, what's life like when I'm not thinking what's life like? What's like, how do, how's that work when I'm not here? What do you, th- what do you, th- you know, and I'm still spun out by the, the idea of it, mm. of not thinking and not being. Um, so... Yeah, that's, I suppose, why I go out and do things. And, and in terms of challenge, you know, Africa, yes, was very hard. The, I think the bodied stuff, you know, just being physically hurting is easy. It's bloody meat and potatoes. It's just the body. It's how you, it's how you interpret that hurt. Mm. Um, not whether you keep going with an injury or whether you, whatever. It's sort of, uh, in, in many respects, um, the hardest parts about my journeys are, are cooking up the next one and which one you go with, I suppose, because I have this huge anxiety problem of what do I do with all this time and energy I've got that's limited. And so that's the biggest challenge. So it doesn't really answer your question because there's so many little moments out there which are hard, but then they're connected to the moment beforehand. So It's a very academic answer. I know, it's a, it's a bit of a, a shit answer. It's a philosophic answer. I tell you what, that when I paddled to work, right, that took four days. Yeah. And it took, I just drove in here now before you came and it took me an hour and 10 minutes to get here. And I'll just float along, you know, listen to the radio. And an hour and 10 uh, is pretty easy in a car and you're buzzing along and you're in this little capsule. Well, it took four full days or about 44 or 45 hours or something. Um, it was freaking hard. It was really hard. Mm. You know, day five, day four coming in. So because I ran out of water essentially about 20 k's from here. So I essentially had to drag the kayak from Western Port Bay to here. And and 12 k into that, you know, and I'd put a hole in the bottom of the kayak by then, dragging on the side of roads. And um, I had bugger all to eat and I was just, it was it was hard, you know, just right. And so that it felt very Arctic, you know, or I was crossing an Antarctic peninsula or something, you know. Was Mitch there filming stuff for you? Yeah, he was. He was that day. Um, does, he, does he eat while you're... Out there, he's it? very good. He's bloody very good. He doesn't never rubs it in my face. Okay, but what good. he what he did to the sweetheart once was he put because there was on the when I walked to work, and it was only eat what I found that particular walk. And he yeah, he planted a Mars bar out there in the field, and it was just too easy. There's this Mars bar sitting there like a golden, you know. And I said, oh, I can't do it, mate. You dirt bag. So I go back to <laughs> now. Just to to um to wrap up the show, um, this has been fantastic. By the way, thank you very much. This is a very different atmosphere to how I'm uh, usually set up for a show. So it was it was nerve wracking coming in here Good today, man. It's a different kind of experience, but it's raw. It's it's a real conversation, and that's that's really what I try and get out of these um, podcasts. Uh, and that's why you know I try and stay away from interviewing people just because they're they're known, they're famous, they're They've actually got something probably cool to talk about, mm-hmm. something that's worthwhile. Um, I was speaking to you before the show. Um, if I got anything out of watching some of your stuff over the last couple of weeks and reading some of the stuff you wrote, is you just don't waste shit. You know, we, yeah. we live in a very wasteful society and and I am, I'm guilty of it uh, a lot of the time. Uh, but, you know, um, there's so many resources that we have out in this glorious planet of ours. Mm. Um, so, yeah, if you take anything from this podcast, don't waste shit. Um, make use of it's it. It's a good T-shirt slogan. That's it. Yeah. Uh, you've got a, another challenge coming up. Are yes. Well, well, I'm, I'm red hot on the... You, you, in fact, could, you could be minutes away. Well, the phone... Yeah, so that just as well, right? I've got the phone on silent, but my wife's due in a week's time for our first child. And... Uh, uh, Helen, if you ever do listen to this, it's our first child. She always says it's my first child. She always puts it as her own. I said, yeah. well, I'll tell you what, I, I had something to do with that, kid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's the next big thing, mate, being yeah. a dad to all this. And uh, Helen and I had a chat on with our phones the other day. We recorded each other, and she asked some great questions about what sort of parents we'll be. And yet you'd, it's, the, it's the next big adventure yeah. and how we do that. Yeah, people often ask if you're ready for it. You, you don't know. 
I don't. I have I don't no. Mate, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm kind of in this blissful state of ignorance right yeah. now because of how little I know. It's good. <laughs> it, it funnily enough, when I was talking to Stu, this was earlier in the year. He his wife was in the same um, boat. She was about to give birth yeah, to right. their first child. Brilliant. Um, a week away from the due date. So, uh, I'm excited for you. Thanks for the chat today, mate. You're a great okay. conversationalist. You, thank you. You're a good listener and you'll be Denton in no time. Oh, thank you very much. All, All right. Josh. Thanks everyone for listening to another episode of Schmooze with Coos. You can catch this podcast on iTunes, Spotify and Podbean or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, YouTube as well if you want to see um, Bo and I in the junk office here in Monash, uh, at Monash Peninsula campus. Uh, this has been awesome and I'll see you all next week. Thanks, Bo. Thanks, Josh. Uh,